On the evening of September 28, 2017, Nikki Adamando, a 27 year old woman, carried a heavy burden in her heart. In a moment of desperation to protect herself and her children, Nikki made a drastic decision and confessed to shooting her boyfriend, Chris Grover, who had subjected her to consistent abuse and threats. The shocking news sent shockwaves through their community, as nobody could have anticipated such a tragic outcome. For years, Nikki had silently endured the abuse inflicted upon her by Chris, with visible bruises and burn marks serving as painful reminders of her suffering. Despite seeking solace from friends, therapists, and colleagues, she hesitated to involve the authorities, fearing the potential loss of her children. Now, as a clear victim of domestic violence, Nikki finds herself entangled in a complex battle to convince investigators that her actions were in self defense. Following her arrest, numerous individuals took to the streets to show their support for Nikki, while loyal supporters of Chris vehemently maintained his innocence, describing him as a gentle and loving person incapable of causing harm. Amidst the chaos, a lingering question arises Was Nikki truly a victim of domestic violence? Or is she a manipulative liar? Poughkeepsie, New York, a city renowned for its historical charm and picturesque location along the Hudson River, has unfortunately gained notoriety due to the occurrence of high profile murder cases, including the tragic incident involving Nicole Adamando in 2017. Despite the tragic events that occurred, Poughkeepsie continues to thrive as a diverse community. Offering a range of cultural and recreational activities. However, the question remains what happened to Nikki Adamando that prompted the entire Poughkeepsie community to rally behind her? Let's delve into the details. On the night of September 28, 2017, Officer Richard Sicily was patrolling the serene streets of Poughkeepsie, New York. It was approximately 2 a.m. when he noticed a car stopped at a red light. Even when the light turned green, the car remained motionless. Suspecting a drowsy or inattentive driver, Officer Cezili politely honked his horn, unaware that this seemingly routine encounter was about to take an unexpected turn. As the car continued to stay stationary, Officer Cezili stepped out of his cruiser and approached it. To his surprise, a distressed woman, standing at just five feet tall and weighing no more than 100 pounds, Emerged from the driver's seat. She was barefoot and visibly distraught. In the back seat, two children peacefully slept. Officer Cecily considered various possibilities. Perhaps the woman was lost or experiencing a medical emergency. However, he was completely unprepared for the shocking revelation that this distressed woman was about to disclose. The agitated woman, Nikki Adamando, quickly informed the officer that something terrible had occurred at her home. Nikki explained that she had been enduring long term abuse at the hands of her boyfriend, which had reached a breaking point on September 28, 2017. When she attempted to leave, her boyfriend, armed with a gun, threatened her with gestures of violence. After confiding in the officer, Nikki urgently reached out to her friend for assistance. Without hesitation, Elizabeth Clifton responded to Nikki's distress call. Upon her arrival, The officers requested that Elizabeth wait in a nearby parking lot, as there were still crucial details that needed to be uncovered. But who exactly was Nikki Adamando? Nikki, whose full name is Nicole Adamando, was born on November 19, 1988. At the age of four, she relocated to Poughkeepsie, New York, alongside her family. Throughout her upbringing, She was recognized as a lively, carefree, and sociable young girl. In 2008, at the tender age of 19, Nikki commenced her employment at a local gym named Mr. Todd's Gymnastics. Within the establishment, she assumed the role of a children's gymnastics coach. It was during this time that she crossed paths with Christopher Grover, a fellow coach and colleague who was 21 years old. Their professional relationship swiftly evolved into something more profound as Chris became Nikki's life partner. Tragically, Nikki alleged that she had shot Chris that fateful night due to his continuous abuse and threats towards her. Upon the officer's arrival at Nikki's apartment, they discovered Chris, 
her partner, seemingly asleep on the couch. However, he had already succumbed to a fatal gunshot wound to the head. A thorough search of the entire apartment revealed a running shower in the bathroom and a damaged laptop in the bathtub. Meanwhile, Elizabeth also received the shocking news of Chris's demise, leaving her utterly bewildered as she had never anticipated such a tragic outcome. Amidst the confusion, Nikki emerged as the sole individual capable of shedding light on the situation. Consequently, she was brought in for questioning at the police station to ascertain the motive behind Chris's murder. Was it truly a result of domestic violence, or were there other factors at play? Simultaneously, Gail Grover, Chris's mother, received the heart-wrenching news of her son's passing from the sheriff. Gail's immediate concern revolved around Nikki and the children. When she inquired with the sheriff, her primary question centered on the well-being of Nikki and the kids. Gail expressed her complete lack of understanding regarding the true cause of Chris's tragic fate. Chris was described as a kind and athletic individual. He possessed an abundance of energy, was outgoing, and exuded charm. With a black belt in taekwondo and serving as the head gymnastics coach at Mr. Tud's gym in Poughkeepsie, Chris was highly respected. His coaching style infused gymnastics with excitement, making him beloved by his students. In 2008, Chris and Nikki's close collaboration fostered a deep friendship that eventually blossomed into a romantic relationship. By 2012, they made the decision to live together, and Nikki expressed her gratitude for Chris's unwavering support, compassion, and understanding. He patiently waited for Nikki to be ready, and after a year, they joyfully announced her pregnancy. Their first child, then, arrived in 2013, and Chris proved to be an exceptional father who adored both Nikki and their child. Two years later, in 2015, Nikki gave birth to their daughter, Thane, further solidifying their family bond. Nikki was regarded as an exceptional mother, as her love for her children was paramount. However, Elizabeth noticed some concerning changes in Nikki. She appeared more anxious than usual, displaying skittish behavior despite her typically gentle and soft-spoken nature. Nikki's sleep patterns and appetite suffered, indicating her overall well-being was compromised. Elizabeth attributed these changes to Nikki's juggling of multiple responsibilities, including studying early childhood education, working at a preschool, caring for her children, and maintaining her job at the gym. Not only Elizabeth, but Nikki's childhood friends, Laura McAdoo and Rachel Hawks, also observed something amiss. It wasn't just Nikki's behavior that raised concern, but the visible injuries and bruises scattered across her body. On September 28, 2017, Child Protection Services, CPS, paid a visit to Chris's apartment following a report from an anonymous parent at the gym where Chris still worked. Concerns were raised after witnessing Chris, losing his temper with students and noticing Nikki, who was covered in marks. The parent became worried about Nikki and the children at home. However, tragedy struck later that night when Chris was discovered dead in his apartment. In the interrogation room, Nikki desperately tried to explain why she had killed Chris. She genuinely believed that the detectives would recognize her actions as self-defense rather than intentional murder. Nikki was confident that her innocence would be proven through evidence and her actions. To her surprise, Nikki was arrested for Chris's murder. This turn of events left everyone close to her and her supporters, who believed Nikki was a victim of domestic violence, heartbroken and questioning why she was being held responsible for defending herself. Elizabeth held the key to this mystery, and it all began in April 2016 when she expressed her concerns about Nikki's injuries. Elizabeth was genuinely afraid for Nikki's safety at home with Chris. In response, Nikki confided in Elizabeth, admitting that Chris was abusing her on a daily basis. However, Elizabeth was not the only one to uncover the truth. Journalist Rachel Snyder, who had dedicated 10 years to studying domestic violence, stumbled upon Nikki's case. After reading numerous articles and speaking to various individuals, Snyder also believed that Chris was physically assaulting Nikki. 
Initially, although Chris displayed occasional violence, the situation was not too severe. During Nikki's pregnancy in 2013, he displayed qualities of gentleness, sweetness, and care. Nikki held onto hope, believing that the arrival of their baby would strengthen their relationship. The anticipation of becoming parents seemed to smooth out the rough patches in their relationship. However, after their son, Ben, was born, their situation took a dark turn. Nikki made the difficult decision to leave her job at the preschool and focus on establishing her own photography business, as well as selling homemade booties for infants. Initially, Chris proved to be a great father and provided assistance with Ben. However, approximately six weeks later, he began pressuring Nikki for intimacy, which placed a strain on their relationship. A few days later, Nikki experienced severe swelling in her face and jaw, rendering her unable to chew. She sought medical help at Vassar Brothers Hospital in Poughkeepsie. Her condition was so severe that a domestic assistance program was contacted to intervene and encourage Nikki to take action. The examiner's records noted the extent of Nikki's injuries, which made it difficult for her to speak audibly. Despite the severity of her injuries, Nikki chose not to file a police report out of fear that Chris would take Ben away from her. Unfortunately, their troubles did not end there. In 2015, two years after the birth of their daughter Fane, a similar incident occurred. A few weeks later, while Nikki was cooking eggs for Ben, Chris demanded that she make enough for him as well. In a sarcastic tone, Nikki replied with a yes sir, which triggered an extreme anger in Chris. He proceeded to grab a metal spoon and heat it on the gas stove flame. Holding Nikki's other arm, he burned her in multiple places with a scorching spoon. Nikki, enduring excruciating pain, could only plead for him to stop. She sought medical treatment once again, and this time, the examiner documented her injuries through photographs. The images revealed bite marks on her shoulder and back, as well as burns covering her body. Chris's obsession with violent adult internet content took a sinister turn for Nikki when he began to act out scenes from those videos, going to extreme lengths to carry out aggressive acts against her. This included tying her up, physically assaulting her, and even using a weapon to choke her until she lost consciousness. Shockingly, Chris recorded all of these horrifying incidents without Nikki's consent. Despite the severe abuse she endured, Nikki hesitated to report it to the police out of fear that Child Protective Services might take her children away if she identified herself as a victim. This fear haunted Nikki, and she was determined to protect her children at all costs. Despite the urging of her friend Elizabeth and others, Nikki's emotional paralysis prevented her from pressing charges against Chris. In 2016, Elizabeth went above and beyond to help Nikki escape her abusive situation. Nikki packed her children into the car and drove to Elizabeth's house, but she couldn't bring herself to stop. She circled in front of the house, slowing down and then speeding up again for hours on end. Elizabeth watched in concern as Nikki repeatedly drove past. Finally, Elizabeth called out to Nikki, pleading for her to stop and come inside. Tearfully, Nikki admitted that she couldn't do it. The fear of Chris's reaction held her captive and she believed that he would never forgive her if she left. Throughout 2017, Nikki sought medical help multiple times for various violent incidents. She had rope-like burns around her neck and body, frequent bruises, and bleeding. Nikki also reported that Chris had a gun and had attempted to use it against her. Then, on September 28, 2017, Child Protective Services made an anonymous visit drawing attention to their situation. The worker discreetly asked Nikki if she was safe at that moment, to which she nodded yes. The worker then inquired about the presence of weapons in the house, but Nikki lied and claimed there were none, despite Chris owning a gun. When the worker inquired about the bruises on Nikki, both Chris and Nikki asserted that they were merely engaging in normal fights and arguments like any other couple. Consequently, the worker saw no reason to take immediate action and departed from the scene. Meanwhile, Chris had temporarily left the house but returned later in the evening. According to Nikki, he appeared calm and even kind. 
Surprisingly, they were intimate after putting the children to bed, and this time, Chris displayed a much gentler demeanor than Nikki had grown accustomed to. At one point, after leaving the room, Chris called Nikki again, this time holding his gun. He asked her to look at it and proceeded to demonstrate its functionality, while she nervously observed. In a chilling moment, he casually mentioned, You know I could kill you in your sleep, leaving Nikki feeling extremely unsafe. In an attempt to relax, she decided to take a shower. However, while she was in the shower, Chris unexpectedly entered the bathroom, stating that he could shoot her in there, but it would be too loud. Shockingly, he then threw the laptop into the tub. After Nikki finished showering, Chris forced himself onto her, creating a distressing and uncomfortable situation. As soon as she entered the living room, Chris instructed Nikki to lie down on top of him on the couch. Feeling fearful, Nikki complied for a while. However, when she sensed that Chris had finally fallen asleep, she cautiously attempted to sneak away. Unfortunately, her attempt took a frightening turn when Chris suddenly woke up and reached for the gun hidden in the couch cushion. In an effort to protect herself, Nikki swatted away Chris's arm, causing him to drop the gun onto the floor. This gave Nikki the opportunity to swiftly grab the weapon and point it at him. Chris reclined on the couch with an air of nonchalance, seemingly unaffected by the situation. This lack of concern may have been a result of the damage he had already inflicted on Nikki's self-esteem and confidence. In a taunting manner, Chris dared Nikki to shoot him, threatening a grim outcome that involved taking both their lives and leaving their children without anyone. Before he could finish his sentence, Nikki swiftly lunged at him, pulling the trigger without hesitation. She believed it was a matter of kill or be killed. However, the night took an unexpected turn when Nikki, instead of being seen as a victim, found herself arrested for Chris Grover's death. In March 2019, Nikki Adamando, who had been out on bail, faced trial for the murder of her partner. The Poughkeepsie court became a gathering place for friends and advocates, all wearing purple to symbolize support for victims of domestic violence. On one side, Loyal supporters of Chris stood, firmly convinced of his calm and gentle nature, unable to believe he could harm anyone. They were shocked to hear Nikki's defense, which relied on claims of his alleged abuse and violence towards her. Chris's mother, Gail, vehemently rejected these allegations and maintained her belief in her son's innocence throughout the trial. The courtroom became a battleground for conflicting perspectives on this tragic and twisted case of violence. Inside the Dutchess County Courthouse in Poughkeepsie, prosecutors argued that Nikki portrayed herself as a victim, asserting that all her claims of domestic violence from Chris were false. Prosecutor Chana Krauss, who had dedicated much of her career to advocating for victims of physical abuse, remained skeptical of Nikki's narrative. To her, Nikki did not fit the typical profile of an abuse victim. During the trial, Prosecutor Krauss emphasized the first piece of physical evidence, the gun Nikki used to kill Chris. She stressed that Chris sustained a direct contact wound to the head. Additionally, the testimony from the medical examiner provided further evidence, stating that the gun muzzle imprint on Chris's head indicated that it was embedded when Nikki pulled the trigger. Therefore, if Chris had been awake, Nikki would not have been able to shoot at such close range. This suggests that Chris was likely asleep at the time of the incident, casting doubt on Nikki's claim of self-defense. Krauss also argued that it was actually Nikki, not Chris, who threw the laptop in the tub, suggesting that Nikki may have been trying to make it appear as if Chris was attempting to hide evidence of violence that was recorded on it. However, Nikki may not have anticipated that the laptop could be recovered in a way that allowed its contents to be examined, revealing no evidence of abuse. To support her argument, Krauss presented a series of texts Nikki sent to Chris days before his death, in which she referred to him as a man-child and questioned his intelligence. According to Krauss, these texts suggest that Nikki was the one who was abusive towards Chris. Adding a twist to the case, Krauss also presented damning evidence of multiple internet searches on Chris's phone on the night he died, 
and she believed that Nikki was responsible for these searches. In a text sent six weeks before the incident, Nikki expressed her frustration, stating, I haven't figured out a way to kill him without being caught, so I'm still here. This led the prosecutor, Krauss, to discuss a dark chapter in Nikki's life that had a profound impact on her. She acknowledged that Nikki had experienced a traumatic event at the age of five during a sleepover at her friend Caitlin's house. Caitlin lived with her mother and her mother's boyfriend, whom Nikki referred to as Uncle Butch. In the middle of the night, Nikki, who was sleeping with Caitlin, was abruptly awakened by Butch, who attempted to assault her. Regrettably, Caitlin, also a victim of Butch, was unable to assist Nikki during that distressing moment. When Nikki confided in her mother, Belinda, about the incident, it was met with denial and a plea to forget about it. Nevertheless, this incident had a profound impact on Nikki, causing her to become an extremely timid and reserved individual. It affected her ability to trust others and influenced the way she formed relationships. Even when Nikki met Chris, she still carried the haunting memories of her past experiences, making intimacy uncomfortable for her. Despite this, Chris, appearing to be a caring partner, respected her emotions and agreed to wait until she felt ready. His love and care for Nikki remained steadfast throughout. So if Chris was always kind to Nikki, how did the stories of abuse come about? Krauss alleged that Nikki fabricated these stories of abuse by Chris. She pointed out that Nikki never reported these accusations to the police, but only shared them with friends and therapists. A few years into her relationship with Chris, Nikki disclosed to her therapists that when she lived in an apartment complex with her mother, her mother would invite maintenance workers over for drinks. On a day when Nikki was home alone, a maintenance worker came by for repairs and attempted to assault her. However, Nikki later admitted that her memories of the attacker were unclear, and she wasn't certain if it was the maintenance worker or if she had confused it with memories involving Chris. Around the same time, Nikki encountered a married police officer who was the father of one of her gymnastic students. He offered Nikki the opportunity to live with him, his wife, and children as a babysitter. Initially, she saw the 45-year-old man as a protector and even a father figure. However, as Nikki spent more time with the family, she grew increasingly uneasy. There was even a point when he tried to abuse and assault Nikki. It is a complex task to understand the circumstances in which their relationship began, particularly considering that she was still living with Chris and was pregnant with Ben. When discussing the marks and bruises on Nikki's body, Krauss contended that her injuries often had innocent explanations. Not all bruises were a result of violence. Many were actually self-inflicted. Krauss highlighted that even the medical records were not straightforward. During Nikki's initial visit to Vassar Brothers Hospital, she was asked a series of questions regarding the abuse, the injuries inflicted on her, and the burn marks all over her body. At that time, Nikki consistently denied that anyone had harmed her. However, after Fane was born, she returned to the hospital and answered affirmatively to every single one of those questions. Krauss suggested that Nikki was attempting to solely blame Chris for all the abuse she had endured, making him the primary culprit. Following the visit from Child Protective Services that night, Nikki feared that her fabricated stories of abuse would be exposed potentially resulting in the loss of her children, which was her greatest fear. As the defense case unfolded, attorney John and Ben Ostrer argued that Nikki lived in constant danger with Chris. They asserted that if she had not fought back and killed him that night, it would have been her life in jeopardy instead of Chris's. Throughout the trial, Nikki's lawyers faced the challenge of persuading the jury that on the night of September 28, 2017, she acted in self-defense. Their argument revolved around the idea that Nikki shot Chris to save her own life and the lives of her children. To support their claims, Nikki's lawyers presented witnesses, including psychologists, examiners, midwives, and friends who testified about the extensive abuse she had suffered at the hands of Chris over the years. These concerned individuals, having witnessed Nikki's distressing situation, were genuinely worried about her safety. 
They consistently advised her to leave Chris and report the violence to law enforcement. Despite their well-intentioned advice, Nikki, scared of Chris, never felt brave enough to take such steps. Furthermore, they presented a photograph of Nikki's injuries and bruises in court, emphasizing that these marks could not have been self-inflicted. They pointed out specific injuries such as bite marks on her neck, rope marks on her neck and hands, and bruises from physical violence all over her body. This raised the lingering question, if neither Chris nor Nikki caused these bruises, then who was responsible? Nikki's lawyers argued that the other men mentioned by the prosecution were merely brought up to create confusion and shame Nikki by suggesting she was involved with multiple men. According to them, the truth was clear. She had no physical relationship with anyone other than Chris. They believed that it was not crucial to focus on whether Chris was victimizing her with intimate partner violence. Instead, they stressed the importance of determining whether killing Chris was the right decision or not. The defense contended that the aggressive texts Nikki sent were typical responses when someone feels uncomfortable, challenging the prosecution's narrative. They also highlighted to the jurors that all the internet searches on how to kill someone while sleeping were found on Chris's phone, with no proof that Nikki had conducted those searches. While some speculated that Chris might be responsible, there was no evidence supporting that idea. The lawyers further argued that the medical examiner, Dr. Newman, testified that there was no proof Chris was actually sleeping at the time of the incident. He suggested that it could have happened the way Nikki described. To uncover the exact truth, they called Nikki herself to the stand so that the jurors could hear directly from her about what truly happened to her. Nikki, visibly shaken and in tears, testified in court about Chris's tendency to lash out whenever he felt disrespected. She recounted instances of abuse, including physical assault, choking, and being tied up for hours. Nikki also revealed that after their child was born, Chris began obsessively watching adult violent content and attempting to recreate it with her. Her attorneys presented graphic photos and videos, although Chris was always absent from the recorded footage. These videos were uploaded on an adult website featuring violent content and disrespectful language under the username Grove Respect. Surprisingly, the jurors seemed to overlook the disturbing nature of the videos. Grove Respect described himself as a 29-year-old cinematographer with a passion for martial arts, similar to Chris. However, the judge ruled that there was insufficient evidence to prove Chris's involvement in creating and posting the videos. The case took a surprising turn when undisclosed evidence emerged, including Nikki's full medical report from 2014 detailing the violence she endured. Additionally, Midwife exams revealed injuries sustained the summer before Chris's death, which had been kept hidden. While it is not uncommon for certain evidence to be excluded in a murder trial, many argue that omitting this evidence was a mistake. Prosecutor Krauss suggested that Nikki may have fabricated the explicit videos herself, as there was no way to definitively identify the man in the footage. Krauss believed that Nikki had been gradually building a case against Chris which explained his absence from the evidence presented. Nikki's anxiety during the trial was also observed by her prosecutors and Chris's mother. After extensive arguments and testimonies in Nikki's case, there were differing opinions, with some believing Nikki's innocence and others thinking Chris was innocent. Following 14 days of testimony, the case was handed over to the jurors, who faced the difficult task of determining whether Nikki Adamando was a frightened victim or a deceitful liar. After three days of deliberation, a verdict was announced. In April 2019, the jury, comprised of eight women and four men, dismissed Nikki's self-defense claim and found her guilty of criminal possession of a weapon and second-degree murder. Consequently, she was sentenced to 19 years to life imprisonment. The jury's decision to convict Nikki, despite her traumatic experiences and potential harm, left many people shocked. Some believed it resembled a real-life Gone Girl scenario, suggesting that Nikki had meticulously planned everything for years, 
even causing injuries to herself to later justify killing Chris. On the other hand, Chris's family and friends felt a sense of relief upon hearing that the jury believed Chris was innocent and not responsible for abusing Nikki in any way. As a result of the updated New York State law in 2019, known as the Domestic Violence Survivors Justice Act, Nikki was granted the opportunity for another day in court. In 2020, a hearing took place where her claims of domestic violence played a significant role in reducing her sentence. This law empowered the judge to take into account the defendant's status as a victim and how it influenced the crime they committed when determining the appropriate sentencing. Judge Edward McLaughlin, who was presiding over Nikki's trial, listened to arguments from prosecutors who asserted that Nikki was not a genuine victim. They argued that she had access to services and could have left Chris at any time, even on the day he died. However, Nikki's supporters countered this by stating that labeling her as not a real victim oversimplified the intricate dynamics of domestic violence. Cross, Nikki's advocate, emphasized that she had the means to leave, including a car, and could have done so on the day Chris died. Nikki's defense team stressed that leaving was not a straightforward option, as she could have faced severe consequences even if she had left Chris, challenging the misconception that escaping abusive relationships is easy. Despite seeking help from support services, Nikki faced challenges in finding a safe way out due to her responsibilities as a mother to two young children. Even on the night of Chris's death, Nikki disclosed to the authorities that she had pleaded with him on numerous occasions, at least 17 times, to let her go. She had promised not to disclose anything. But Chris adamantly refused to allow her to leave. In Nikki's defense, her legal team argued that leaving an abusive and violent partner does not necessarily guarantee one's safety. They emphasized that even if Nikki had left Chris, the risk of harm could persist, making leaving not a guaranteed option for her safety. The defense suggested that escaping an ongoing abusive situation posed its own set of dangers and challenges for Nikki. In February 2020, the judge leaned towards the prosecution's argument, stating that Nikki was very close to her front door on the night Chris died and could have left. The judge also noted that Nikki's inconsistent statements about past abuse made it difficult to determine the identity of her abuser. However, despite this, many of Nikki's supporters firmly believed that she was the true victim, emphasizing that all the documented instances of abuse point to Chris as the perpetrator. Nikki's supporters gathered outside the Poughkeepsie courthouse, and although the court did not overturn her conviction, they ruled in her favor. They decided that she deserved a reduced sentence under the Survivor's Justice Act changing it from 19 years to life to seven and one-half years in prison. With five years already served, Nikki's release was scheduled for 2024, and she was ultimately released on January 4, 2024, at the age of 35. While Nikki served her time behind bars, her children found a home with relatives, and the Grover family faithfully visited them every other day. Nikki and Chris are the sole individuals privy to the enigma that unfolded on that fateful evening of September 28, 2017. Regrettably, only one of them remains alive to recount their perspective. Domestic violence is a pervasive issue that can affect anyone, yet voicing one's experience proves to be an arduous task. Considering these circumstances, it prompts us to ponder, was Nikki genuinely a victim in this particular instance? Alternatively, despite seemingly possessing an enviable life, was she a deceitful manipulator? It is said that on February 4, 1989, at around 4.15 a.m., an intruder broke into an apartment in the 3100 block of Casa de Campo, San Mateo County, California. Using a kitchen knife he found in the apartment and a bandana to hide his identity, the intruder used violence and threats to get into a woman's bed. He gave her a horrifying experience that included stabbing, strangling, and assault. Surprisingly, the victim managed to get the attacker to back down and immediately called the police. How did the assailant get in without being noticed? And who might this unidentified intruder be? 
With a population of 764,442, San Mateo County is well known for being close to Silicon Valley, which has an influence on its lifestyle by blending urban and suburban elements. Parks and historical sites are examples of recreational areas that add a cultural touch. While the crime rate is comparatively low when compared to other parts of California, the population is diverse and frequently involved in technology and innovation. The safety of the community is prioritized. In 2023, the John Harris Jr. cold case is brought up, bringing attention to one case of unsolved crime in this otherwise tranquil county. A violent incident occurred in the quiet neighborhood of San Mateo, California, in the early hours of February 4, 1989, leaving the 3100 block of Casa de Campo scarred for many years. In a disconcerting security lapse, a single man entered an apartment. His first action was cutting himself with a kitchen knife, a common object that was turned into a weapon. The burglar really went overboard when he proceeded to the victim's bedroom and began attacking her there as well as at her residence. The suspect launched a physical and psychological attack on her after climbing into the bed in which she was sleeping. He choked and stabbed the victim in what turned into a struggle for her life, barely missing her jugular vein a deadly coincidence that spared her life. The woman showed an incredible will to live despite such horror. She fought back against the attacker, who was hiding his face behind a bandana. Her fortitude was impressive, and she persuaded him to leave the apartment through a combination of bravery and quick thinking. This act of convincing the assailant to leave would later pique the interest and amazement of all who heard about the incident. The woman immediately called the police. When the police were alerted, they descended on the scene with a sense of urgency. They conducted interviews and meticulously processed the crime scene in search of fingerprints, DNA, or any other clue that could lead them to the perpetrator. They exerted great effort. The attacker's identity was still unknown despite the meticulous attention to detail. The trail became quiet, and the leads grew cold as weeks turned into months and months into years. The assault case file was filled with notes and reports but no definitive answers. The perpetrator of the horrifying crime within the walls of that apartment vanished into the ether, leaving behind a victim still dealing with the fallout and a community in shock. The DNA evidence gathered from the Casa de Campo attack scene was stored for more than 30 years. A silent witness, waiting for science to catch up. As DNA technology advanced, investigators did not let the case gather dust. They persevered in resubmitting the DNA evidence, hoping that each time there would be some revelation that would allow the truth to be heard. Their perseverance was rewarded. In December 2020, the evidence from that fateful night collided with the ongoing use of technology in forensic science. A match was discovered. An accomplishment that would have seemed almost miraculous to investigators in 1989. It turned out that the man identified by the DNA match, John Harris Jr., had resided in the victim's neighborhood. John Harris Jr. had stayed out of the public eye for the previous 30 years, even though their paths had not intentionally crossed. Following the event, he appeared to have lived in San Joaquin County, not too close to the crime scene, but far enough away to avoid being noticed. He had moved to Arizona by the time of the DNA match. Law enforcement and the community were both touched by the revelation that the suspect was leading a regular life and may have thought that his chances of success had diminished with the passage of time. After Harris' identification, the case gained fresh momentum after going cold. New leads were now shedding light on questions that had lingered for years. Equipped with fresh data and a name, the inquiry team began piecing together John Harris Jr.'s movements and life during the previous three decades. They had to know how he avoided being detected, and what connections he might have had to the area he had once called home. After the identity of the suspect was made public, the case took a significant turn and now had a defined course. It reinforced the message that justice is persistent, no matter how long it takes, and it gave some hope to those who think the case may never be solved. Thanks to a DNA breakthrough, the name John Harris Jr. is now at the center of a long-standing cold case that is coming out of the shadows. Who, though, is John Harris Jr.? His background is complicated and mysterious, much like the crime he is suspected of. He was born in 1966. Since the public still does not know the specifics of Harris' birth parents or early years, 
he appears to be a ghost in the story of his own purported crime. It is thought that Harris spent the majority of his life in San Joaquin County, California. However, little is known about his life outside of his neighborhood. By 2020, he had established himself as a resident of Arizona in the context of his career. In Manteca, California, Harris carved out a niche for himself working for a company that installed surveillance systems. An ironic detail considering his subsequent criminal accusations. Harris appears to be a man who has managed to live a private life, based on the scant information available about him. It is known that Harris was not a very noticeable person. There were no obvious indicators of a difficult upbringing or difficult educational path that the general public is aware of. The abrupt connection to a violent crime is all the more startling given the lack of a known criminal past. Harris is the primary suspect in an attempted murder case, and his DNA has permanently linked him to a horrific deed, raising the possibility that beneath the surface of a normal life, there may be a history of darker tendencies. There have been no disclosed marriages or family relationships. In many ways, Harris appears to be a lone individual cut off from the social pillars that support most people's lives. His former community in San Joaquin County and beyond have surely felt the impact of his name becoming associated with the case. The close proximity of a man suspected of a dangerous crime is causing discomfort to neighbors who previously might have simply nodded to him passing. John Harris Jr. experienced an abrupt upheaval in his life at the age of 55. He was taken into custody on Wednesday, February 25, 2021, on suspicion of attempting murder. He was apprehended by the long arm of the law not far from his Manteca, California workplace. Not only was this arrest the consequence of diligent police work, but it also marked a significant advancement in DNA analysis. The arrest was made by local detectives in collaboration with district attorney investigators, according to San Mateo Police Chief E. Barberini. It took Matt Broad, an inspector with the district attorney's office, persistently reopening the case at the request of district attorney inspector Kevin Raffaele for there to be an immediate connection. At the time, Raffaele was a San Mateo police surgeon who was heavily involved in the investigation of this especially unsettling case. The investigators' determination was unwavering in their pursuit of justice for the atrocious crime committed in 1989. Harris appeared to have lived a nomadic life in the Bay Area, having lived in the counties of San Mateo, Alameda, San Francisco, and San Joaquin. Despite this, he had remained unnoticed, as his DNA was not found in the National Law Enforcement Database. To establish a connection, the investigators had to pivot and use advanced genealogical methods similar to the one used to discover the identity of the infamous Golden State Killer, Joseph James D'Angelo. In the end, it was his DNA that linked him to the case. Inspector Broad said that this scientific match would become the cornerstone of the case, unquestionably connecting Harris to the crime that had plagued the victims and the community for more than three decades. This statement summed up the results of tireless investigative efforts. As he considered the nature of the crime, Raffaele noted how inhumane it was and how it left a lasting impression on the people who worked the case. At the time, San Mateo was not used to handling crimes of that terrible caliber, and the local law enforcement had a collective memory of this specific incident. Steve Wagstaff, the district attorney, acknowledged the intricacy and skill of the investigation. Since Harris's DNA was missing from the databases that were usually checked, the investigating team had to use more creative ways to find the criminal. After being arrested, Harris was detained at the San Mateo County Jail with a hefty half a million dollar bail. The community, which had previously been unaware of a seemingly ordinary man's dark past, was now confronted with the chilling reality of his alleged actions. For the victim and others impacted, this arrest represented a much-needed step toward justice and closure. On February 25, 2021, a gloomy Friday afternoon, John Harris Jr. appeared before the bench at San Mateo County Superior Court in Redwood City to answer to his charges. The seriousness of the situation was evident as he was about to be arraigning for two serious charges, attempted murder and aggravated mayhem, both of which carries a harsh life sentence. Given the gravity of the accusations, Justice Barbarous handled the case with a calm disposition. Following Supreme Court Rule 23, 
The courtroom recognized that the rulings in this case would not establish a precedent, therefore the case's implications were limited to the present. When delivering the court's ruling, Justices Barbarous, Vaughan, and McKinney presented a united front. John Harris Jr.'s attempt to review his conviction was unsuccessful due to the intricate legal proceedings. The court summarily dismissed his post-conviction petition and attempt to revoke his previous guilty plea for first-degree murder. This dismissal was not taken lightly. Following Harris Jr.'s appointment to the Appellate Council, the Office of the State Appellate Defender, or OSAD, submitted a withdrawal motion claiming that there was insufficient justification for the court's ruling to be incorrect. Harris Jr. was given the chance to reply, but he did not, so the court granted the motion and upheld the dismissal. The background to Harris Jr.'s current situation showed a complex legal battle. He had first accepted a guilty plea to first-degree murder in exchange for a shorter sentence of 25 years. But allegations of incompetent counsel and coercion emerged, and his guilty plea was temporarily withheld at a subsequent Crinkle hearing. The state's argument that they were unfairly excluded from the Crinkle hearing resulted in the guilty plea being reinstated. On appeal, Harris Jr. claimed that his constitutional rights were violated when the guilty plea was reinstated. The court denied the appeal, stating that the initial withdrawal was premature and that his plea was voluntary and informed upon review. Harris Jr.'s subsequent post-conviction petition was an attempt to work around these previous rulings. He asserted new arguments of collaboration between the trial court defense counsel and the prosecutor, but the court rejected them. The OSAD upheld the verdict. His actual innocence claim, which lacked new evidence or proof, was also rejected by the court. The petition was properly dismissed within the procedural boundaries, according to Justice Barbarous because it did not present any reasonably arguable issues. Finally, the court's decision was binding, the motion was granted, and the judgment was upheld. Harris Jr.'s attempt to obtain a new trial was ultimately unsuccessful due to the principle that once a case is decided, it cannot be pursued again. In a recent news conference, San Mateo Police Chief Id Barberini expressed the victim's relief and gratitude in the John Harris Jr. case, which had gone unsolved for over three decades. The victim, who has been through the unimaginable for the past 32 years, now has some closure. The arrest of a suspect was made possible by the combined efforts of the San Mateo County District Attorneys and Investigators, the FBI's San Francisco and Los Angeles Divisions, Manteca Police, and San Mateo Police Detectives. It demonstrates their commitment and the power of collaborative law enforcement. Authorities have stated that there may be additional victims. They are currently processing additional DNA in order to uncover additional evidence to help with the ongoing investigation. Police in San Mateo are encouraging anyone with information about Harris to come forward.